Can you hear me? Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to start off with announcements, but before I do, uh, I just want to update you guys on how our Carowinds trip went. Um, all the youth had an amazing time, but I have to brag on two people real quick. My wife drove the van all the way there in the traffic, and she was having a heart attack, I think, but we made it through, so. And uh, Miss Gail came along with us, and at first I was like, Man, I guess she must like to walk or something because that's, you know, that's all we're going to be doing all day. I didn't think she would get on any rides. She rode every single ride in the, in the park, <laughs> even when our youth kids wouldn't even get on. She was getting on them. So. But um, our first announcement, July 17th, we have men's meeting and breakfast at 8 a.m. Uh, see Richard Lanning for questions or information. Um, July 25th is Baptism Sunday. And our uh, August 1st is Youth Sunday, so our youth is going to be doing the, um, the whole entire message for us. And also that day we have new members class, so if you need to be in the new members class, just, I guess, talk to Clint. And he'll straighten it out for you. <laughs> um, we also have uh, ball games Monday and Tuesday at 7.30 at, what's the name of the park? Brevard at the park in Brevard yeah but uh, that's it for announcements and I'm gonna open this up in prayer dear Lord thank you for letting us be here again this morning to worship and honor and praise you uh, it's such an honor to be in this church with a bunch of great believers let us continue to grow together and grow stronger in the name of your son and thank you for sending him so that we may have salvation, Lord. So bless this message today. Give Clint the words to uh, speak to us and deliver his message, your message strongly through him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, Miss Linda. Well, as the choir comes up here, good morning, everybody. How's everyone? Good. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a couple, uh, at least one really familiar hymn. Um, this was known at my last church as the Portersville Bible Church hymn because about every week, every Sunday night, we'd have a half hour singing, and somebody requested this song every week. But it's a favorite and I, I want us to, even though it's for very familiar, I want us to take a minute and think about the words. I mean, the chorus itself is a prayer to God saying, you're dedicating your life. You're turning your life over to him. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Think about that when you're singing that. Do you really mean that? Because words have power. Words have meaning. So as we sing this, let's think about all the words to all the different um, verses, and then each time as we sing the chorus as a prayer to the Lord. And we're going to sing a little faster than normal. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me, oh Jesus Lord. 
wouldst give thyself for me. I owe no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live. Oh, Christ, for thee alone. Living for Jesus through earth's little while. My dearest treasure, the light of hope you really meant that. Mm -hmm. Now let's sing uh, another um, really precious song. And, and the reason that we are willing, not only that Christ gave his life for us, but that we love him and he deserves our love and our praise. So let's sing together, I love you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I hadn't planned on having a choir number this week, but choir practice was so tremendous Wednesday night, I said, let's sing a choir song. So I hope you get a blessing from this.
like a real choir up there, man. Shoot. Notice, uh, I, now I used to sing with them, now I sat down and they sound good, so maybe I should have made that move a little bit earlier. All right. Are y'all awake this morning? Mm, partially, part of you are partially awake. This ought to be a good service then. <laughs> I'm excited to preach to a halfway asleep, halfway awake, partially present congregation today. Hey, man, well, we are in the book of Hebrews, working our way through, uh, beginning at chapter 1, ending at the end of the book. Today, we find ourselves in Hebrews chapter 8, so if you'd find your place in your copy of God's Word, or turn on your copy of God's Word, and scroll to Hebrews chapter 8. What is the title of our sermon series? Greater. Greater. Now, I know some of y'all are intellectuals, and theologians, and great studiers of the Word of God. Now... I'm kind of a low-shelf man myself, and uh, I just need it really down low where I can get it. So I appreciate the writer of Hebrews, especially in chapter 8, because he just says up front, here's the main point. <laughs> and I thought, I'm picking up what you're laying down, man. So uh, I'm glad that the writer of Hebrews is abundantly clear, and as you're finding your place in your copy of God's Word, I'll just give you a quick review for those who have not been with us, or maybe you have forgotten since last week we were outdoors and kind of got off track from Hebrews. Uh, but in Hebrews chapter 1, the writer is making the statement that Jesus is greater than any angel and every prophet. He's greater. And that's the theme of the book. That's the subject matter of the book. It's about King Jesus and the, the thesis and the statement and the reality is that Jesus is greater. He's greater than any angel, greater than every prophet. Hebrews chapter 2, he goes on and says that, hey, Jesus is a greater king. He's a greater captain. He's a greater brother. In Hebrews chapter 3, he goes on and shows us how much greater Jesus is than Moses. He shows us how much greater Jesus is than the law. How many of y'all are familiar with the law? This is just Angie. She's passing out kid bags. She does it every Sunday. We don't need to stare at her. Y'all listen to me. Hey, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, 3, he says Jesus is greater than Moses and the law. How many of y'all know what the law is? The Big Ten. I'm not talking about the football conference. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten. Now, how many of y'all are glad that Jesus is greater than the Big Ten? A few of y'all, the rest of y'all have obviously kept them to the T, your life. I'm glad he's greater than the Big Ten. So he says, hey, he's greater than the law, greater than Moses. Hebrews chapter 4, he goes on and says he's greater than your effort. He is greater than the best that you can do. As a matter of fact, here's what you should do because he's greater. You should rest in his greatness. And Dee told me never preach on rest again. <laughs> he said... Never preach on rest again. I said, why, brother? He said, because I hadn't got any since you preached on it. So uh, the, the writer of Hebrews says he's greater than your effort. So rest in what he's done. Hebrews chapter 5, he goes on. He says Jesus is not just greater than Moses, but he's also greater than Aaron. He's greater than the Levitical priesthood. He's greater than the sacrifices that Aaron and the Levites would offer on behalf of the people. Jesus is greater. Hebrews chapter 6, he said Jesus is greater than anything. He's the anchor for your soul. Jesus is greater. Hebrews chapter 7, he goes on and he talks about this Melchizedekian priesthood. Melchizedek is that Old Testament priest of ancient Jerusalem who has no beginning and no end, which means he can represent anyone, anytime, anywhere. So he says in Hebrews chapter 7 that Jesus is the greatest priest. He is the perfect priest. He's holy, he's blameless, and he's pure. And here in Hebrews chapter 8, he helps me out a whole lot. And he said, here's the main point. So in case you're a little bit slow like I am, today hopefully we can kind of <laughs> sum up what the writer of Hebrews has been saying. This is the climax of his argument. This is the apex of what he's been trying to say. This is the main point. So if you would stand out of reverence for reading God's word, Hebrews chapter 8. We'll begin at verse 1, read to the end of the chapter, and you'll leave well-educated and not thoroughly confused. Amen. Amen. Here we go, verse 1, Hebrews chapter 8. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. So there's your main point, first two verses. Follow along with this thought here in verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, this Jesus, this priest, also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. 
who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, and he's referencing God, for he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there no place would have been made for a second. Which makes sense. Because finding fault with them, he says, and he quotes from Jeremiah chapter 31, Behold the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Somebody say amen right there. That's good news. <laughs> I'm in a room with a bunch of sinners. Y'all better say amen. That is good news. I'll remember their sins no more, their lawless deeds no more. Last but not least, verse 13 in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first covenant obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. You may be seated, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the writer of Hebrews. We thank you most of all for the one whom he's writing about. We thank you for King Jesus who is on high, who is seated at your right throne, who is in the heavenlies, who is serving us and who is making intercession for us and who lives to ever pray for us. We thank you for the one who took our place. We thank you for the one who removed our sins. We thank you for the one who has forgotten our sins and our lawless deeds. We thank you for Jesus. For if it not for Jesus, we would not be here. Lord, we thank you for sending him. Lord, let us never grow old of hearing the story of Jesus coming into this world. Let us never get tired of hearing about the forgiveness offered at the cross of Calvary. Let us never get tired of singing the songs and anthems of forgiveness, Lord, where you have blotted them out. Lord, today I pray you'd speak clearly and loudly through your word. Use me, your man, to proclaim to your people. Lord, I pray that you'd put it in our hearts to continue to be a people that seeks your kingdom first, stands on your word always, serves for your glory. We pray your Holy Spirit would be the only spirit operating here today, and we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Hebrews chapter 8. Greater. Who said amen? Micah, you get, son, you get extra credit today. I love it. Ain't y'all glad to see kids in here in the choir, in the pew, hollering out amen? Amen. That's good stuff, man. I like that. I like it. So Hebrews chapter 8, he is making his main point. This is the main point. He's talking about a greater priest, a greater servant, a greater mediator, a greater covenant built on a greater promise. And so uh, with that being said, I just would like to open up by saying, uh, how many of y'all ever been to a, a live concert, live music event? Yeah. It's so great. There's nothing that can really replace that personal interaction with the person on stage. And... The 1930s, we, we understand, I wasn't around, some of y'all were around, the 1930s, there was this thing that come out about this big around, you laid it down and it had an arm that you had to pull over and push a button, now what was that called? A who? A phonograph or a record player, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think it took 33s, somebody's going to have to correct me, that was a little bit before my time. So, so there were 33s, but over time, over time and not a whole lot of time, there was something that came out a little bit smaller, and they were called 45s. We ain't talking about a handgun. We're talking about a vinyl record. <laughs> Don't draw on me. We're talking about a record, 45s, and because they were smaller, they would spin faster, and they were a higher fidelity way to listen, a clearer and crisper way to hear what you could not experience in person. But even after time, the 45s were replaced by this, what looked like a VHS, and I know these guys are thinking, what's a VHS, but what was it called? Eight track. She had one. 
an eight-track player. It even came in vehicles. But then over time, they were replaced by a smaller cassette tape, which even over time was replaced by a smaller than 45 and thinner CD, which was then replaced by Napster and, y'all help me over here, this is the younger crowd, MP3s, which is now replaced by direct streaming services. And for $5 a month, Nancy can attest to this, Apple Music, you can hear anything you want to hear anytime you want to hear it in high definition, audio and sometimes video. What I'm telling you is that everything that man is involved in becomes obsolete. Everything that man's hands are on fades away. Everything that man can put together and put forward and everybody says, ooh, a 45 will be replaced by something that people say, wow, a CD that will be replaced by people saying, I can stream it live on this box I hold in my hand and see it and hear it live in high definition. Things become obsolete. Uh, now, now, again, I love sitting and talking with folks that have a little more age on them than I do. These folks, Miss Ruth, I, I spoke with her yesterday, day before yesterday. She is 92 years old. And that woman, I thought, she has seen some stuff change. She has seen a lot of things become obsolete and replaced. And, and it's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. He says, listen, guys, listen. I know you want to go back to listen to the 33s, but you have a high-definition digital direct stream download right now. I, I know you want to go back to spinning a 45, but you have something better now. And he's talking about Jesus is greater. He's clearer. He is the image of the invisible God. He's right here. He's present. He's greater. And so he's making his case, and he's making his main point, is what he says in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. Now, this is the main point, and the main point is this. Jesus is the greater promise. Jesus is the greater promise. Now, I'm going to give you four reasons why the writer of Hebrews says he is the greater promise. The first reason that he's the greater promise is because Jesus sits while others stand. And you're thinking, well, is Jesus lazy? No. Jesus sits because his work's done. The work is done. Man, the writer is abundantly clear. Jesus is greater. He's the greatest priest, and he serves from a position of supreme authority. Now, the old covenant and the earthly tabernacle that he mentions here were temporary. And I'll give you a guess of what they have become now. They're kind of like the 33. They become obsolete. Now, at this time, the writer has writing the book of Hebrews. Uh, the fall of Jerusalem has not happened, and they're still offering sacrifices, blood sacrifices. And can you imagine being in that context and thinking, I'm placing my faith in the invisible God where I don't have to bring a turtle dove, I do not have to bring a goat, I do not have to bring a ram, I do not have to bring a bull, I do not have to bring an animal and see it slaughtered and see its blood spilt and splattered and spattered to forgive my sins. <clears throat> I'm making a radical decision and saying I'm believing in a God that I can't see. There's nothing tangible that I can put my hands on and say, here's, here's my effort. Here's my part. Here's what you need from me. Here's what I can do. Because I've told you since we've been studying the book of Hebrews, find every other religion. Actually, find every religion. And tell me what it's built on. Your work, your performance, your deeds, what you do and do not do. Christianity is not a religion. It is totally and radically different from every other religion because you don't have to do a thing <laughs> except accept what has been done for you. It's not what you do. It's what's been done for you. And at that point, you operate in what Jesus has done. And so he says, listen, Jesus is sitting while others are standing. Others are standing and slitting the throats of animals. Others are standing and splattering blood. Others are standing and serving the people. Others are standing and showing effort. Others are standing and doing their job. But while others are standing, Jesus is sitting. And he's making that great point that, listen, these guys served in an earthly tabernacle that you could see, taste, and smell. There's some empirical evidence that a God exists. However, that is now obsolete. There's no longer a need for bulls and goats. There's no longer a need for turtle doves. There's no longer a need for you to spill, spill the blood of any animal because the supreme sacrifice has been made. And he says, while others are standing, 
Jesus is sitting. Now, he's pulling at the Jewish mindset because how many of y'all are familiar with the tabernacle in the Old Testament? Ish. So, so Moses goes up, God comes down. Y'all remember that? So, so much so that when Moses went up, everybody else stayed down. And when God came down, it's great fear and trembling. But God gave him some dimensions and some plans and an architectural structure to build a tabernacle. He gave him colors of yarn. He gave him dimensions for sheets and blankets and veils. And he gave him the right metal to make the right utensil, to make the right piece of furniture, to make the right sink, to build the right table, even the right wood, even the dimensions of the table and the types of wood and the types of material. And then the Bible says he even put in man the ability to hammer those things out and form and fashion those things. And you've got to remember there had never been a tabernacle before. It wasn't like you could call up the Cody Builders and say, hey, Dan, I need a tabernacle. And he'd show up and blueprint it out and build it. No, this was the first. There had never been a tabernacle. And what he's doing by pulling on their Jewish mind is making them see the blue and the scarlet yarn. Making them remember the veil that separates the people from God. Showing them the priest that is serving as an earthly mediator between God and man. He, he's reminding them of the lavishness of the tabernacle. He's reminding them of its majesty. He's reminding them of the ornate details and the carvings and the lampstands, again, and the lavers and the sinks and the furniture that would be surrounded this scene of the tabernacle that the priest actually served in. And they would have remembered this. There's furniture for every ceremony, for every ritual, for every sacrifice. There's a piece of furniture. There's a utensil. There's a process. There's a design. Here's what there's not. There's not anywhere in that tabernacle for the priest to sit. Do you know why there was no place for the priest to sit in the earthly tabernacle? Because his work was never finished. Do you know why? Because the writer of Hebrews already told us that he had to offer a sacrifice for his own sins first and then the sins of the people. And if he's a sinful man touched by sin, which he is, which you are, then he continually had to offer a sacrifice for himself and yourself. You're welcome. Y'all encouraged yet? You bunch of sinners? He had to offer a sacrifice for him and them. So there was no place for him to sit. Do you know why? Because it was a continual slaughter of animals. It was a continual sacrifice. It was a continual, something continually had to die. Something continually had to be presented. Somebody continually had to be appeased. Why, why, why? Because people are sinful and they continue to... Oh, man, y'all are catching on. But what he's telling them is Jesus is a greater priest of a greater covenant built on a better promise. That's why he's sitting, because his work is complete. And he's telling them, don't go back. Do not, do not go back to having to bring sacrifices. Do not go back to the obsolete and old system. Do not go back to the way it used to be. Do not go back to fulfilling your forgiveness by your efforts because I'll go ahead and tell you your efforts fail every time. My efforts fail every time. Do not go back because why? Because why, writer of Hebrews? Because Jesus is sitting while others are standing. That's important. That is important because what's happening in this earthly tabernacle, he says, is simply a copy and a shadow. Not only is Jesus sitting while others are standing, which is a very important piece of the message that the writer is giving us, but Jesus is the sacrifice while others offer sacrifices. Please pontificate upon that, preacher. I think I will since you asked so nicely. He goes on in, in verses 3 through 6. And he says, listen, since every high priest, and you read what I read, we read it aloud, we read it together. Since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices, our high priest also must make an offering. So what kind of high priest would Jesus be if he didn't have a sacrifice to make? He wouldn't be one at all. What kind of high priest would Jesus be if he didn't have an offering to give? He wouldn't be a high priest at all. You see, the, the writer is just using simple logic. To tell the people, listen, he is a greater high priest because he offered a greater sacrifice, made a greater offering, made a greater plea, made a greater way because it's a greater covenant built on greater promises. Some of y'all are slow, man. It'd take y'all an hour and a half to watch 60 minutes. Y'all better tighten up. We're talking about Jesus and how much greater he is. Ain't y'all glad you didn't have to bring a turtle dove this morning to get in the church building? 
Ain't you glad that tomorrow, whenever you mess up, because it's not if, but when you mess up tomorrow, you don't have to go out and slaughter a red heifer and lay it on an altar somewhere to appease a distant deity. How many of y'all are happy about that and glad about that? Amen. Why? Because Jesus is a greater priest who made a greater sacrifice, who sits while others stand, but he also is the sacrifice while others are simply offering sacrifices. And there is a difference. Because... He's proven that Jesus is a better priest because all priests had to offer something, and Jesus did. So basically the prerequisite for being a priest is offering sacrifices and gifts, being qualified by the law, because did you pick up what he was saying there? He said he would not be a high priest at all since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the... Now what did the law say about a priest? I'm going to see if y'all been paying attention. Seven weeks down the book of Hebrews, the law said you had to be from a certain tribe. Tribe of Levi. Levi. They're not just make denim, they also made high priest. You had to be from the tribe of Levi to be qualified to be a priest in the temple of the living God. You couldn't just wake up and say, oh, I think I'll be a priest. Probably not. You couldn't be a priest because you were mama called and daddy sent. The only way, the only way you could be a priest is if you come from the tribe of Levi. Do you know which tribe Jesus was not from? <laughs> not from the tribe of Levi. He was from the kingly tribe. Not the priestly tribe, but the kingly tribe of Judah. So the prerequisite for being priest is offering sacrifices, and you had to be qualified by the law. But here's, here's an interesting thing I learned this week. Jesus never, and I ain't even thought about it, Jesus never, ever, ever, in the 33 years that he walked the face of the earth, offered an animal sacrifice. Never made a sacrifice. Never offered a sacrifice on any altar. Read the book. Find it. Let me know. He never, ever offered a sacrifice. <laughs> or did he? Never offered a sacrifice according to the law of Moses. Jesus was, as a matter of fact, disqualified to serve according to the law of Moses disqualified to serve as a priest. So do you see the tension in the Jewish mind and in the Jewish culture of I'm following the way, I'm following Messiah, I'm following Jesus, I'm following this Jesus who was killed, crucified, and raised from the dead. You're doing what? Because we're fixing to go to the temple. We, we, I mean, that's why we got our goats on a leash. That's why we got our cages full of pigeons and turtle doves. We're, we're going to the tabernacle because we're going to cover our sins because we're sinful people and we've got to make a sacrifice and we had to bring the best that we could bring and we had to put our hands on it. We have to give it to the priest and we have to see the priest and the priest physically has to kill it so that our sins are covered. And he said, no, no, I'm following the way because not only did he cover my sins, he removed my sins. He, he, he blotted them out. He said they're as far as the east is from the west. He said he remembered them no more. He cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. That's shouting ground this morning because there's some tension there that we always have to have our hands on what we're doing so that we can get some credit for what he's doing. Because if we can put our hands on it, we can give it, then we've had a part in our salvation. But, the, but Jesus is the sacrifice, while others are simply offering sacrifices. Man, he was disqualified according to the law of Moses, but here's the interesting thing. There were plenty of priests qualified according to the law. Plenty that could kill a goat, plenty that could kill a turtle dove, plenty that could kill a bull, a ram, a lamb, plenty that had the right family, Levi. Plenty that had the right age, because there was an age from, somebody correct me, 30 to 55, is that correct? 30 to 55 is the only years that you could serve as a priest. They had the right family, had the right age, had the right pedigree, had the right qualities, had the right abilities. There were plenty of priests that could offer sacrifices according to the law. But there was only one priest that was qualified to be the sacrifice. Many could offer sacrifice, but only one was qualified to be the sacrifice. That's why Jesus is totally different than any other religion. That's why Jesus is totally different than religion, period. That's why Jesus is totally different than any other sacrifice ever made. That's why the life of Jesus demands attention, demands respect, creates controversy, creates division. Do not think that I come to bring peace, Jesus says, but I came to bring division. Oh, y'all didn't read that part. That's another sermon for another day. Y'all read your Bible to help my preaching, but Jesus, Jesus is different. 
Why is it that people get so offended when you mention the name of Jesus? Why is it that you can go to a high school or college football game and you can open up with a word of prayer, but you ain't going to end that baby in Jesus' name? Why is it that the name of Jesus is so offensive? Because he's a greater priest, a greater sacrifice. I mean, if there ain't nothing to him, what you so scared of him for? If there's no power in his name, why can't we pray in his name? If, if he's powerless and rendered useless and his bones are somewhere bleaching in Palestine, then what do you care if we talk about him? What do you care if we preach in his name and pray in his name and propagate his gospel? What does it matter? Because Jesus is different. Because Jesus is greater. Because Jesus has been given the name above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every, every, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Here are your two options. You can do it here or there. This side of eternity, the other side of eternity. He's made a plan and a way for you to do it on this side. There's only one priest that could be the sacrifice. Man, there were many that would offer, but only one that could be the sacrifice. There was only one priest from the order of Melchizedek. Why is that important? I review because he had no beginning, because he had no end, because he had no ancestry. This Melchizedekian priesthood could represent anybody, anytime, anywhere, cover any sin, atone for any wrongdoing. He, and only he, he's a better ministry of a better covenant built on better promises, but also Jesus gives forgiveness while others bring works. And I know y'all are not works-based people. You know, I, I know none of y'all wake up and say, well, God is more pleased with me today because I read the whole Pentateuch this morning before the sun ever come up. So, I, you know, I'm his favorite today. But tomorrow he hates me because I didn't even read a verse. Y'all don't do that. <laughs> Quiet time. I'm being real. Y'all don't, don't, don't think that sometimes God's more pleased with you or sometimes he's mad at you. I mean, that's the reason why I have flat tires, my washing machine breaks, my air conditioner burn out. It's because God's mad at me. Yeah, because he's a tyrant and I didn't please him, so he's going to punish me. Because a sadistic God who loves to punish people, get their attention. Is that what? Is that? It's not what the Bible tells me. The Bible tells me he loves me so much he died for me. As a matter of fact, when God the Father looks at me, he don't even see me in my sinfulness. He sees his perfect, holy, righteous son that died in my place. When he looks at me, all he can do is be pleased with me. As a matter of fact, this copy of God's Word tells me that I've been adopted into the family of the living God. I'm now called a son of the Most High God. I was born to Chuck and Rose McKnight, but now I'm a, I'm a son of the Most High God. This word tells me that I'm a joint heir and a co-heir with Jesus the Christ and that I will reign with Him one day. Man, we've been studying through the book of Revelation and, and it just seems like Hebrews and Revelation just belong in the same book. It's really strange, like it's all part of one big plan. But I'm telling you, Jesus brings forgiveness, listen to me, while others bring works. It's why he quoted from Jeremiah. You've got to get in a text and see what's going on. He even says for in verse 7, if that first covenant had been faultless or perfect or flawless or if it would have done everything that it needed to do, then there would have been no place for a second covenant. So God messed up the first time, didn't he? By sending that old covenant. That's why we just... Us and Andy Stanley and some of these other guys, we just need to go ahead and dismiss ourselves from the Old Covenant. We just need to go ahead and just rip the Old Testament right out of your Bible because we don't need it no more. Is that right? No. Well, what gives? God's first attempt failed, so he had a new covenant, sent Jesus. Let me guess. Man probably messed up so much that he thought, this Old Covenant ain't going to work. I, guess I don't need to send Jesus. No. Maybe he was sitting there and he thought, well, I think this first attempt is going to work. And when it didn't, he thought, well, I'll just send Jesus. I mean, ain't another way to do it. I'll just send Jesus. Or could it be that God is sovereign and he knows all things of all times, past, present, and future? He's eternal. And he, could it be that he had plan A? Uh, could it be that Jesus is not God's plan B? 
Could it be that Jesus has been the plan of redemption from the beginning? Could it be that Jesus has been deemed the high priest that can only represent humanity to a living God since the beginning? Could it be that in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 there's a messianic prophecy when the man Adam and the woman Eve failed? They were in perfection. In perfection. In perfection. You don't know what me and you do, Adam and Eve. The one thing we can't do. <laughs> I wish y'all'd wake up. Yeah, how many of y'all raised kids? Y'all killing me this morning. I'm gonna preach at 2:30. How many of y'all raised kids? How many of y'all said, "All right, you can do blah 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 blah," but don't do this? What's the first thing they do? I am convinced, and you will not prove me otherwise. The reason God's design of family, mom and dad and children, is to show us our sinfulness. Now, I don't mean that in a funny way. I mean that in a serious way because every time I say. You can do this, this, or this, but do not do this. When I look out the window, you know what they're doing? All of them. That. And it's that quick that God reminds us and shows us that's exactly what happened in the garden. I said you can have all of these things, and we forget about all of these things. He said, just don't do this. And the one thing in paradise they couldn't do, they couldn't stay away from. Had to have it. And God curses the serpent, and he says... You will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. First, first messianic prophecy we see. There's going to come one that you're going to attack. There's going to come one. You, you might bruise his heel. There's going to come one that you'll be given some liberty to, to have your way with for a while. There's going to come one that you're, it's going to come under attack. There's going to come one that you're going to bruise, but your day's coming. He's going to crush your head. You'll only hurt him, but he will kill you. He will obliterate you. And from Genesis 3 and verse 15 through the rest of the book, we see God's provision of a Messiah. And Jeremiah in chapter 31 has told Israel in Jeremiah, because I'm telling you, whenever the writer of Hebrews said this, here's what they wanted to scream, heresy. You know why? Because there are sacrifices. And there are bulls and goats and rams. And you know what? It's the way we've always done it because Aaron... Aaron was appointed. And if we don't do it that way, it don't work. But Jesus came in for fit. No, 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 no. That guy was a long-haired hippie, daisy picker, just said love, love, love. He had nothing to do with this old system of sacrifice because this is what we do because of Moses and Aaron, and they put it in place, and God said do it, and we're going to do it. But Jeremiah says, listen, and, and what the writer's doing is he knows. He knows what's in their mind. He knows. So he says, listen, I'm going to have to defend this from Scripture. And not just Scripture, but from an Old Testament Scripture. So who does he quote? The prophet Jeremiah. What does he say? Mine's italicized. I don't know if yours is. It should be in quotations. And here's what Jeremiah says. He's quoting Jeremiah. This is not the writer of Hebrews writing it. He's quoting the Old Testament, Old Covenant prophet Jeremiah. And he says... What does he say? Find it. There he is. Behold, <laughs> the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Wait a minute, Jeremiah. You know better than that. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. How many of y'all say amen right there? <laughs> and I disregarded them, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make. Now, I really tried to emphasize, I will here. He says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds, lawless simply means sinful, and their sinful deeds I will remember no more. So Jesus is the greater promise, not just because he sits while others stand, and not just because he is the sacrifice while they simply offer sacrifices, and not just because he offers forgiveness and others bring works and works-based salvation, but he's the greater promise because Jesus is eternal while all others are temporary. Expound on that. I will because the new covenant offers internal motivation and power instead of external list. L look at the Big Ten. And I'm not bashing the Big Ten. 
And I'm not saying go home and break your tablets in your front yard. I'm telling you to look at them and tell me how many of those are internal. They're external. They're external. It's an external list. And we act as if we check those external actions off that God is pleased with us. The law was never meant to save us. The law was never meant to make us righteous. As a matter of fact, if all you have is the law, you have enough to be damned. Period. Because Jesus said if you've broken one, you've broken them all. So what Jesus does and this new covenant does that Jeremiah prophesied about that Jesus fulfills is offers internal motivation and power instead of external list. The new covenant is based on a close relationship instead of distant fear. Do you remember Mount Sinai? It came down, they couldn't even get close to the mountain. It was, it was, it was a distant deity whom they feared. But the new covenant is one who says, I'm not ashamed to call you brother. I, I'm a better captain. I'm a better priest. I'm a better prophet. It's a better covenant. The new covenant emphasizes forgiveness and mercy instead of failures and wrongdoings. Again, the whole Levitical system is predicated on this. You're going to mess up. What does it highlight? Your sin. <laughs> that's, that's what it's built on, your sin. The new covenant is not built on your sin. The new covenant is built on Jesus' finished work on Calvary. The new covenant is built on grace and mercy that came because the supreme sacrifice died. The new covenant highlights Jesus, not you. The old covenant highlights you, not Jesus. Because all it highlights is your failures and your flaws and your wrongdoings. Now, preacher, that sounds too easy. If they have the faith of a little child, it is that easy. You mean to tell me? I don't have to perform for God to be pleased with me? You mean I don't have to read a chapter a day in his word for him to be pleased with me? You, you mean I don't have to help every old lady across the street at Ingalls when I get there and God's pleased with me? You mean if I don't cuss and God is pleased with me? You mean if I don't do these things, God is pleased with me? If I do do these things, fill in the blank, God is more pleased with me? I mean, there's nothing you can do. It's Jesus plus nothing. Th that's the book. It's Jesus plus nothing. We, we get it backwards, much like this guy, and I forgot to mention him, uh, A.J. Jacobs. Anybody know A.J. Jacobs? He's wrote a bunch of books. He's not a Christian author by a long shot. But he wrote this book, 2007, The Year of Living Biblically. And here's what he did. He said, I'm going to take one year, and I'm going to live literally by the book. And he, he's running, he, and he's not a believer by a long shot. He's from a, um, a Jewish family in New York, and He's also making light of several biblical principles, but his thing is that Christians or evangelicals as a whole say we take the Bible literally, so he captures that statement and, and, and performs a year's worth of living it literally. And so he does things like in Deuteronomy, the Bible says, now here's what good Baptists know, we ain't supposed to have tattoos. Y'all know that? <laughs> but right before that, it also says we're not supposed to wear mixed garments. And I'm not going to ask how many of y'all's got on 50-50 shirts this morning, 70-30 polyester and cotton. Uh, it also says this, don't trim the corners of your beard. So what this guy does, he grows out a beard like he's on Duck Dynasty or something. I mean, he don't, he don't trim his beard. He, he hires the guy, you can read the book, hires the guy and brings him in to qualify his clothes to wear so that he's wearing 100% garments. And essentially what he does is become a legalist to the point where he even records himself um, flicking stones at people that he knows are having an affair with their spouse because the Old Testament says stone adulterers. So of course, he didn't pick up a bowling ball. He just was flicking you know, little stones. It's almost humorous what he's doing. But the problem, and what I've seen in that, is that's the way many Christians view Jesus, is that I've got to adhere and here's what we do. Here's what we do. I'm, I'm, I hate it. I, I, we say, if I perform the right way, then, then God accepts me. You know, if I do all the do's and I don't do all the don'ts, then God's pleased with me. And, and we become, that's quite essentially, we become practicing atheists. Because we live as if the sacrifice Jesus made has no effect on our life. 
And we live as if we have to earn God's blessing by performance. Y'all, y'all don't... Y'all don't I'm the only recovering legalist in the room. Because, I, I mean, I'm serious. And I still struggle there. I think, well, God's obviously mad at me today because I didn't do this. Or he is very pleased with me today because I did do this. And that rest sermon that me and Dave really didn't like has really struck home with me because I think the rest is not laying down sleeping. The rest is knowing that what Jesus did is sufficient. Because he's a greater priest. Because he's offered a greater sacrifice. Man, He's eternal where others, i got to get back on track. He is eternal while others are temporary. Here's what I want to draw your attention to, and i got to close. i got to. We're about 12 o'clock. What does that mean to the preacher? <laughs> Nothing. Yes. I don't even want to look up. I was giving you an opportunity to get me. All right. Here's what I wanted to do and bring your attention to in that uh, prophecy that he is quoting by Jeremiah. Notice that the old covenant is built on this. If you will. If you will. Read it. Read the old covenant. If you will. If you will, I will. So if and then. Y'all ever read that? If you will, humble yourselves. I will. Bless your land. That's some old covenant stuff. If, if you'll obey me, I will bless your nation. He's talking to Israel. If, if you will, if you will, if you will. But notice what it says in Jeremiah 31 referring to this new covenant because the old covenant is built on it, if you will. Jeremiah, he just, he just squares them up right here and he says, here's what the new covenant is built on, I will. Did you notice that? Different verbiage and words matter as Miss Linda taught us this morning. Words matter. Words carry meaning. If you will means part of this is predicated on you. How many of y'all are in a marriage covenant? Oh Lord, help me. I'm about to get up out of here. I said, how many of y'all's in a marriage covenant? Y'all better raise your hand or I'm going to give your wife liberty to slap you. <laughs> Lord, help us. Jesus. A marriage covenant, how many does it take to enter into a marriage covenant? Two. And as much as we like to say that it's, an un- it's a conditional covenant. It's a covenant and a covenant takes two parties. Here's the problem with the old covenant. Mankind always dropped his ball on his side. Man always messed up his side of the covenant. Man always broke his side of the covenant. That's what he said. So he goes on and he quotes Jeremiah and he says, here's the new covenant, I will. That, that, those are good words. I will. Do you know why God says I will? Because you can't. <laughs> you know why he says the new covenant is built on I will? Because you will not. Oh, I'm going to kill. You know, I know how it is on Sunday. Woo! Praise the Lord. I ain't sinning. I ain't cussing. I ain't doing none of that all week. And before Sunday evening and the sun sets, we done messed up. And that was, that was a Sunday morning. We done messed up. But he says, listen, I will. And I'm not telling you, that, I'm not giving you a cheap grace theology. What I'm telling you is what he says, what Jeremiah says, I will. I will be to my people. I will be merciful. I will remember their sins no more. I will forgive them. I am eternal. Why is that important? Because if you understand the price he's paid to forgive your sins, then your life will look different. Your life will sound different. You will not be doing the things you used to do. You you will not go to places you used to go. You will not engage in the things you used to engage in. You will not participate in the things you used to participate in. Not to get the church's approval and not to get God's approval. The reason, the reason there's a change is because you understand internally. And Jesus has been saying, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount is the same message that the writer of Hebrews has given us in chapter 8, and that is the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And if your heart understands the price that he paid in your life will look different, not the other way around. And that's what he's telling them, don't go back to the externals. It's not the externals that are the focus. It's the internal because if the internal is right, the externals will follow. He says Jesus is eternal, man. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus has been the answer to man's sin problem ever since the fall. The Old Testament looked forward to Messiah coming. The New Testament looks back on Messiah. Jesus is the greater priest ministering a greater covenant built on greater promises. Matter of fact, Jesus is the greater promise. Jesus can save you to the uttermost. The writer has already told us. He's greater than any system. 
of religion, greater than any code of ethics, greater than any religion, greater than any organization. He is the greater promise. So today, here's the challenge. It's 12 o'clock, maybe 3 after, maybe 4 after. 4 after. Don't fire me. Here's the invitation. Jesus is greater. I want to ask you, are you living in his greatness or are you trying to live in yours? And I'm talking to believers and unbelievers alike. Because believers, we get caught up and we say, well, I'm living in how great I am. In other words, I'm not doing all the wrong things, but I am doing all the right things. Today, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, that's a burden too heavy for you to carry. You, you, you'll drive yourself crazy and you'll end up where this unbelieving man that wrote this book ended up. You'll walk around flicking stones at people because you think they're adulterers. That, that's not the life that Christ intended for you to live. He intended for you to live a life of freedom. Yeah, we talked about it last week. If you know the truth, then the truth will set you free. And if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Not free to do anything, but free to do the right thing. So today, believer, I want to challenge you to examine your heart and mind. Are you operating in the freedom that Christ has provided for you? Or are you operating under some stinking legalistic religious obligation? I mean, and, and if that's you today, you don't have to tell me a thing, man. Bring that thing and lay it at the feet of Jesus and say... I have not taken literal what you said about operating your freedom and finding rest there. Again, not laying down sleep and finding rest, but finding rest knowing that my salvation is not predicated on me. For the unbeliever today, I, I don't know where you're at spiritually, but maybe you, the only God you know is this tyrant that has lightning bolts and plenty of them in his quiver, and every time you mess up, he's willing to stab you and wanting to stab you and looking to kill you because he hates you because you're a sinner. No, that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of the Old Covenant. That's not the God of the New Covenant. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible loves you, wants to redeem you, wants to restore you, wants a relationship with you to the point where He sent His Son to die for you so that now you are considered righteousness. Not because of what you say and what you do, but because of who you believe, who you follow. So this morning, I don't know where you are. The invitation is wide open. Maybe you say, Preacher, you preach to me today. Maybe you say, that guy ain't making no sense. I need to ask him some questions. Come talk to me. Maybe today you say, I love what's happening here. I want to be a part of what God's doing at Horseshoe First Baptist Church. I'd like to discuss being a member. Come to me. I'll tell you what that looks like. The invitation is wide open for salvation, fresh commitments, church membership, anything you need to lay at the altar. And you say, what's an altar, preacher? Well, we just talked about it. No covenant an altar is where we deal with sin. So why do we have an altar here? It's where we deal with sin. And I've said this before, the closer you get to Christ, the more flaws are revealed in your life. The person that responds is not the biggest sinner. The person that responds, best I can tell, is the person that's drawing closer and closer, closer to Jesus. Because the closer they get, the more is revealed about themselves. So this morning, the invitation is wide open. As the music begins to play, I ask you to stand. Stand to your feet. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. The invitation is wide open. Come talk to me. Come leave your worries here. Leave them with the King who is the greater promise.